Good afternoon and welcome to Clare College Digital Gala Week. We're on the final day of what's been a really interesting and mixed week of talks and I hope that you've all enjoyed visiting Clare from all over the world um, as we've been able to be in your living rooms and studies from so far away. My name's Katie Astley and I'm the Interim Deputy Development Director at Clare. Before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of points of housekeeping. Firstly, I want to let you know that the session is being recorded today um, and the link to the talk will be available shortly on our website, probably by this afternoon, but certainly by tomorrow morning. Please do feel free to share this link with anybody else that you think might be interested to see Patricia's talk. In terms of the format of today's session, we'll be allowing plenty of time for questions. Uh, so please do feel free to submit any questions for Patricia using the chat function as she's speaking. Um, and I will uh, field those to Patricia after her talk. Just remains for me to introduce Patricia. Uh, Patricia is an Emeritus Fellow of Clare, as well as a uh, former senior tutor and former Director of Studies in the History of Science. Indeed, she was my Director of Studies nearly 20 years ago, <laughs> so it's really exciting to be here today. Patricia is the former President of the British Society for the History of Science, the author of many prize-winning books, and a regular guest on BBC Radio 4's In Our Time. In today's session, Patricia will guide us through a visual tour of scientific caricatures designed to make people laugh, but also to think. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but its message is not always easy to decipher. And Patricia will help us to do just that as we learn about science's history and have some fun along the way. So Patricia, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'll just share my screen. So welcome, uh, welcome to Gala Day, everybody. And I'm going to be giving my talk today based on a COVID project uh, where I've been planning a book and I have a slight problem, the slide won't change. Right, here we are, here's the title, Dr. Jenna and the Bath Butterfly. And that's the lecture is going to be based on a book that I've started thinking about writing, but haven't quite finished yet, uh, over the COVID period. And if I ever, get around to writing this book, I plan that it should be called something like a scientific caricatures from Newton to Curie, which unfortunately seems to be right under where it says Katie Astley on my screen, but I'm not sure if there's anything I can do, do about that. So scientific caricatures from Newton to, uh, to Curie. Um, I intend this book as being uh, a sort of rather fun way of learning about history of science, a sort of scientific 1066 and all that. Uh, because, of course, we'd rather lost a lot of the topical references, so now it's rather painful, but a lot of these caricatures have to be explained, but they're not just about science. A lot of them have got far wider political and religious implications as well. And that does mean I should warn you that some of them now do seem rather offensive, and that's because science can reflect prejudice, but it can also contribute to reinforcing it. So I'm going to start by talking about someone you definitely have heard of, and that's Charles Darwin, who's probably the most caricatured uh, scientist ever. And his most famous book on the origin of species came out in 1859. That's his big book on evolution by natural selection. It was enormously controversial when it came out, and he never had the courage in that book to write about human beings. Twelve years later, he'd got a bit bolder and he wrote another book called Descent of Man, where he talked specifically about evolution of human beings. And that book generated a huge number of caricatures. So here's one of them. You can see Darwin looking like an ape. He's got his, his toes wrapped around some sort of stick or club, and he's got long prehensile arms. And you can see in comparison with the portrait that he was a wonderful gift to caricaturists with those beetling brows and that light of genius shining off that huge forehead. And also he's got that very distinctive large nose, and he always complained that he inherited his large nose and his stammer. Uh, from his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. And he became instantly recognisable. One thing I quite 
find quite strange as he actually really loved it. He collected all these caricatures. He wasn't embarrassed. So one day, much later, years later, a visitor came around and he got out his caricature collection. And he, he, he said, oh, the head is cleverly done, but too much chest. Couldn't be like that. So here's, I'm going to show you an, another one. Here, his face is very similar, but it's actually a much more sinister illusion. You can see he's, he's uh, got a monkey sitting on his lap and uh, sitting next to him. And monkeys are definitely lower down the scale of nature than orangutans. And the snake, the ape, and the, is looking in the mirror. And so it really emphasizing the basic identity between Darwin and this very simian looking creature. And to underline that comparison, the closeness of that particular caricature came with two quotations from Shakespeare. This is the ape of form and some four or five descents of um, since. So I'm now going to show you the first Darwinian caricature. Am I a man and a brother? And I think this one, more than the others, is very obviously not just about science, but about political and cultural questions as well. And it came out in May 1861, and that was the same month as a best-selling book by an American explorer in Africa, Paul de Chaillou. And here's a picture from his book, and you can see here he, uh, with another man, they're confronting the gorilla. Uh, actually, that seems quite easy when there's two men with a gun against one gorilla, but he wrote the book as an absolutely terrifying adventure book. So gorillas really came to symbolize the, the awfulness, the, the savage state of African nature. So, of course, the, am I a man and a brother? that's taken directly from Am I Not a Man and a Brother, which is the famous abolitionist slogan and medal produced by Wedgwood. Uh, Josiah Wedgwood was Charles Darwin's grandfather's grandfather. And like Darwin himself, he was very committed to abolition. But this caricature, the one on the right, came with a rhyme as well. Am I satyr or man? Pray tell me who can and settle my place in the scale. A man in ape shape, an anthropoid ape, or monkey deprived of his tail. So ostensibly, this is a rhyme about the identity of a gorilla, but of course it's also reviving uh, old debates that were still ongoing about the relationship uh, between Africans and Europeans and primates. And that was, uh, and people put those in, uh, People thought that they bore very different relationships to each other. It was a very controversial subject. And these remarks extended to Paul de Chaillou himself. Um, his origins were a bit obscure. He just sort of emerged. No one quite knew what his parentage were, was. And so even those who claimed to be his allies emphasized animal traits that they attributed to this possible mixed parentage. They wrote his diminutive stature, his negroid face, his swarthy complexion made him look somewhat akin to our simian relatives. And there was also another association. Uh, if you were English, there was an association with the Irish people. And there's uh, the caricature on the left is from 1867, uh, just after there'd been a, a revolt in Ireland, which had been unsuccessful. And you can see that the Irishman, the Fenian, that's a sort of precursor of the IRA, the Fenian is given very, very simian features. So on the right, you've got the gorilla wondering, am I, am I a man and a brother? And then on the left, you've got the Fenian who's being portrayed as if he were an ape or an ape-like creature, a primate. So there's lots and lots of caricatures along this theme about Darwin and various other people during the 19th century. But I'm going to go back to what's called the golden age of caricature in this country. And the prime um, example of that is James Gilray. And I'm going to talk in more detail about these two caricatures, Dr. Jenner on the left and the bath, um, butterfly on the right. The ones I've shown you previously the one the 19th century ones of darwin were all printed in newspapers so they were in black and white but as you can see these are colored they weren't sold in newspapers they were sold as single prints 
And people pasted them into albums like this. This album's quite interesting. It, um, it, it's a, a collection of caricatures by Gilray, but a lot of them are very erotic. And so the collection was suppressed in the 1840s because it was seen so scandalous. And then um, sometime in the 20th century, they were having a clear out at the Ministry of Justice and they found a bin liner with uh, this book and several others thrust into it. So it's now been retrieved and it's in the British Library. So these prints were originally printed in black and white, but then they were painted at home, often by women who were paid very, very low wages. And that's why, as here, they, the same caricature can appear in different colours. They were very expensive, so people bought them to show off to their friends. So here's two examples of how people decorated the rooms of their home uh, with these prints. Unfortunately, a lot of them got painted over by very enthusiastic decorators during the Victorian period. But these are two examples that have survived and that you can still see. And the prints were displayed for sale in shop windows. And that meant that even though people couldn't, who, people who couldn't afford to buy them could look at them in the shop window. So that extended their political influence. And a lot of Gilray's prints uh, were shown in this shop window. It's um, a woman called Hannah Humphrey at 27 St. James's Street. And at first sight, this looks rather like a classical banana skin joke. There's an elderly man who's slipped on, on the ice um, and you can see his wigs flown off and his braces have snapped. So his trousers are going to fall down and his coins have all fallen out of his pocket and the dogs bark, barking at him. But there's also it's sort of got more subtle undertones to it. So he's originally you can see he was a very privileged man but um, ice and snow take, have no respect for class. So now he's reduced lower down than the, the people looking in the shop window, some of whom, especially the boy at the right, are really, really rather scruffy. And there's all the prints in the window, but all the people who are looking into the window are also caricatures themselves. They've got very exaggerated physiognomy, very exaggerated face, facial features. And they also show quite a careful selection of different classes of people. And another characteristic I find very interesting of these shop window caricatures is they challenge us as the viewer to think about our own position. We're looking in at an elderly man who's being caricatured, who's standing in front of some people who are being caricatured, some passers-by, who are looking in at a shop window full of caricatures. So what does that say about us? And what does that say about the relationships between different classes of society? So here, I've identified Dr. Jenner uh, wearing the brown jacket I've shown him with a red arrow. And Dr. Jenner, as you may know, um, suggested a new way of protecting people against smallpox by using infected material from people who had cowpox, which is a related disease. And he claimed um, that the scarring uh, from, small, from his system of vaccination was far less, but that the protection was just as effective. So on the left, uh, there's a scar which is left from the smallpox vaccination, and on the right, there's a far smaller, neater one left after the cowpox vaccination. And he tested the, vac the vaccine. He actually hadn't done it very thoroughly by our standards. So he had the idea that if, you, if, um, if someone had had cowpox, they would then be protected against smallpox. And so he took some infectious matter from um, a spot on someone on a woman with cowpox and then he sort of borrowed the little boy that belonged to the gardener he's called james phipps and he with knives he cut little little sort of scrapes in in the boy's arm and then he rubbed in this infectious matter and then the boy got a bit ill got a fever but then after a few weeks that all disappeared and then this is the bit which i find quite alarming he deliberately infected the boy with smallpox and watched to see what happened. And luckily for everybody, including James, uh, James recovered. 
I think if that happened now, we would be absolutely appalled by the ethical implications of that rather perfunctory testing program. We did try it on a few more people afterwards, but that was the basic test. But that wasn't what people were worried about then. That didn't concern them at all. What worried them was the idea of injecting into a human body material that had come from a creature, a cow, that was far lower down on the scale of nature. And they, people, critics, kept um, sending round alarms that people were going to start turning into cows. So here's just one of those vaccine, uh, one of those vaccination caricatures. So you can see there's a huge animal. And on the left, there's the doctors, they've all got horns and tails, and they're feeding baskets of infants into the maw of the, this great monster. And at the other end, the monster is excreting them. Uh, this time, they've all grown horns. So this was long before Charles Darwin's evolution by natural selection. Humans were still thought of being at the top of the scale, and so they'd been created separately by God. And it seemed very sacrilegious to contaminate them with substances from cows. So Gilray's caricature, there were several caricatures like this, but this was by far the most famous. It shows William Woodville's packed clinic at the St Pancras Smallpox Hospital. And you can see at the centre there's Jenna, and he's in the process of inoculating the woman on the chair who looks absolutely terrified. And just to his right, Jenna's right, there's a small scruffy boy who's wearing the badge of a local charity. And he's holding a big uh, bucket and it's labelled vaccine pock, hot from the cow. And that's what Jenna is putting in this woman's arm. And you can see behind her, uh, there's people who've already uh, been treated. You see they've got these sort of cow-like um, warts and lumps coming out of their face. Uh, over to the very far right hand side, there's a pregnant woman who's just about to give birth to, uh, she's vomiting up a small cow. Uh, next to her, there's a man in a red vest and he's excreting a cow and others have got tumours growing from their faces. And above them all, in the middle of the picture at the top, there's a framed picture. And that shows people bowing down before a cow on an altar. And that's a reference to the biblical story of Aaron, who blasphemously encouraged the Israelites to worship a golden calf. I think, unlike modern anti-vaxxers, these protesters did have some justification. I mean, I don't think people were going to turn into cows, but the, um, the vaccinations were carried out under very unhygienic conditions, which meant that quite often there were infections afterwards and people did get quite seriously sick. So here's Dr. Rowley of Oxford, and here's a picture um, that he's drawn of a boy, and you can see how swollen his face is after he was vaccinated. But that wasn't the way that Dr. Rowley interpreted it. Dr. Rowley called him the cowpoxed ox face boy, and he became quite well known. And as he put it, the boy's face seemed to be in a state of transforming and assuming the visage of a cow. So in 1853, smallpox vaccination was made compulsory for babies. And this idea of it being compulsory raised all sorts of problems. And it, the, the whole procedure remained very controversial right through the 19th century. So this is another vaccination caricature. It's right from the end of the century in 1899, and it was reproduced in Punch, and that's why it's in black and white. And it's got a punning title, Triumph of Degeneration. That's because at the end of the 19th, the early 20th centuries, that there was a lot of panic about degeneration, which is the sort of complement, the, the mirror image of evolution and progress and improvement. There was this idea that everything was going backwards, that people were degenerating, uh, both at a personal level and a national uh, level. So at first glance, this looks like a straightforward warning against getting vaccination, except actually it's the opposite. So you, there's, there's the Grim Reaper, and he's wielding his scythe, and he's stalking the land, civilizations crumbling all around him. Next to his right foot, uh, there's an hourglass and the sand is running out, and he's trampling on a copy of the Lancet, 
and he's the, uh, he's brandishing an anti-vaccination banner. But when you look at it more closely, the caption at the bottom says the bill for the encouragement of smallpox awaits the third reading in the House of Commons. And that was because when smallpox was made compulsory in 1853, a lot of parents decided that it was dangerous, um, which did have some truth in it. But they also said that it was anti-democratic, that it was every parent's rights to decide whether or not their child was going to be vaccinated. And uh, when this, this particular caricature you see now, when it was passing through Parliament, a bill was being passed that would enable parents to withdraw their child. And Punch is campaigning for this bill not to be enacted because Punch thinks that vaccination is a very, very good idea. So they thought would, um, not having children vaccinated would encourage smallpox. But uh, this might sound rather a familiar story that the, um, in its process through Parliament, various compromise decisions were made, the government sat on the fence, and what came out at the end was a very, very unsatisfactory half measure that to qualify for exemption, parents had to convince magistrates that they conscientiously believed vaccination would damage their child's health. So this was the orig original meaning of conscientious objector before the First World War. But of course, it's very difficult to prove that you definitely, definitely believe that it's going to ch harm your child's ha health. And it was particularly difficult for women because a lot of magistrates thought that the women, the mothers, shouldn't have any say in what happened to the child, that the child belonged to their fathers. So this was a postcard produced by the Suffrage Society about the rights of women. And you can see um, so, so this, this woman doesn't want her baby to vaccinate, be vaccinated. So she's saying, my baby ain't fit to be vaccinated. And the man's not interested in what she says. And she says, it's no good for you to come here. Where's your husband? And the husband's at sea. Well, be off with you. Mothers don't count as parents. So um, the whole vaccination uh, problem, uh, the whole vaccination controversy got mixed up with the debates about suffrage as well. So I'll turn now and I'll talk about my second major example, the Bath Butterfly, which came out again by Gilray in 1795. And it was directed against Joseph Banks. Joseph Banks was president of the Royal Society for 42 years, but before that, he was the botanist who'd gone to Tahiti and then on to Australia and around the world with James Cook. And Banks had paid for for all his equipment and people um, to help him himself. Um, but the mission ostensibly was to go and measure the transit of Venus when there's sort of like a mini eclipse. And you can see at the bottom, the planet Venus looks as though it's moving across the sun. And that was the only big voyage that um, Banks went on. He didn't go on the second, the, second and third of Cook's voyage. And a lot of pictures have been generated of Banks. And I'm going to start by showing you my favorite one. And this one is by a Tahitian man called Tupaya. And after they'd finished measuring the transit of Venus, Cook revealed that he had secret uh, messages, secret instructions from the Admiralty to go on to Australia and seize it for Britain. So he set off uh, through the Polynesian islands towards Australia. And luckily for them, they had Tupaya with him because Tupaya showed them how to steer between the islands. And the thing I really like about this picture is that the Maori and Joseph Banks are symmetrical. They're the same height, they're even, and they're exchanging goods. So the Maori is giving Banks a crayfish, which he needs for the sailors to eat. And Banks is giving to the Maori some Tahitian bark cloth, which the Maori really wanted. What none of them wanted were all the trinkets and glass beads that the British brought out um, from Britain to give to the natives, in quotation marks, that they, uh, the local people just were not interested in that stuff at all. So when they got home three years later, Banks became very famous as a seafarer. He wrote a book about it. 
uh, and a lot of British pictures came out, although they look very different. So this is one, um, one just one of many sort of satires about Mr. Banks in uh, Tahiti, and it was called the Planet Venus, which lent itself to a lot of jokes and a lot of uh, caricatures and pamphlets came out mocking Banks's sexual employ exploits while he was on Tahiti. And here he is showing the people, and he's telling them to look in the telescope. If they actually had looked in the telescope at the sun like that, they'd have been blinded. But he is being depicted here as a European who's superior to the local people. And when Banks got home, his uncle commissioned this portrait of him by uh, Benjamin West. And you can see in the background near his right shoulder, there's all sorts of spears and other Tahitian artifacts that uh, he and Cook plundered while they visited the island. And you can see he's got uh, European clothes on underneath, but he's got a New Zealand cloak wrapped around it. And the cloak is made of flax. And near his left foot, there's an open book. And that's the botanical journey, journal of the voyage. And the book also is open at flax. And that was because flax was a very important commodity for the Navy. They needed wood for masts and they needed flax to make the sails. And so I interpret this picture as being sort of rather a promotional advertising picture for banks to demonstrate that traveling to foreign places really can be worthwhile because you bring back all sorts of valuable material. So at his own expense, banks paid to have an engraving made of this picture so they could be reproduced en masse and much cheaper versions could be bought. And I think that he produced that engraving because there were quite a few caricatures coming out about him and he needed to counterbalance them. So there's the one on the left where he's got his feet on both halves of the globe and the rhyme underneath says, I rove from pole to pole, I ask you why. I tell you truth to catch a butterfly. A butterfly was a sort of code work for something that was very, very trivial and um, temporary and effervescent. And the word macaroni is interesting. During the eight, uh, 1770s, it was a very, very common term for rather foppish young men who'd been sent off to Italy on a grand tour and come back. And there were loads and loads and loads of macaroni caricatures and they a lot of them played on the sexuality of the young men so this is that's just um, the martial macaroni and the journal said a macaroni is a kind of animal neither male nor female a thing of the neuter gender it talks without meaning it smiles without pleasantry eats without appetite rides without exercise wenches without passion so these were some of the very loaded implications of this caricature about banks and in this other cari caricature of a shop window of caricatures, rather like the one I showed you earlier, Slippy Weather, if you look up at the top left of the window, you can see the caricature of Banks that I've just uh, told you about. And then all the people in the street, just as before, have been caricatured. So this was a caricature of Banks that was very, very much on public display. A lot of people could see it, a lot of people could laugh at him. He became president for 42 years, and this is his favorite portrait. And you can see he, he's looking incredibly, incredibly powerful. He's sitting in his presidential chair. He's got all the insignia of the Royal Society. And he's wearing a very prominent red band with a silver star on his chest. And those are the insignia of the Order of Bath, which he'd been awarded by um, George III. And it's a very, very high honor but although he was president for such a long time, a lot of people within the society really had very little respect for him. He was seen as being very autocratic. He was not particularly smart. He didn't write any scientific papers. What he was extremely good at was boosting the prestige of the Royal Society and persuading all his influential friends to finance expeditions and to finance research. So he did really a huge amount to consolidate the financial status, the national status and reputation of the Royal Society, even though scientifically he wasn't very influential. And so that's the caricature that appeared three days after 
he was awarded the Order of the Bath by George III. You can see it says a great South Sea caterpillar transformed into a bath butterfly. People at this stage weren't really sure where caterpillars came from. So this one's emerging from the banks of the South Seas. And it says um, in the middle of the quotation, it is valued, the butterfly, the bath butterfly is valued solely on account of the beautiful red which encircles its body and the, sh and, the, and the shining spot on its breast, a distinction which never fails to render caterpillars valuable. And you can see Banks is looking very, very proud. And in the sun, at the center of the sun, there's a crown. So this is, this is the solar glory, the royal power of George III, which is shining down on Banks, who's incredibly proud and pleased with himself. And you see there's all sorts of shells and insects in his wings, but there's also near his left shoulder, there's also a bonnet rouge, which is the symbol of the French revolutionaries, because science was often associated with Paris and with France. So just to finish, I'm going to go back to this book that I'm going to write. Um, and it's got the word caricatures in the title. And I've been saying caricatures all the way through uh, up till now. And some of you might wonder why I didn't say cartoon. Now to us, this looks like a cartoon. And I think that's probably what we would call it. But at the time, until the middle of the 19th century, it, it was not called a cartoon, it was called a caricature. And a cartoon was something like this. This is a, an example, a large painting by somebody like Raphael. And this is said to be Cartoon Zero, the first ever cartoon. And it's by John Leach in Punch, the middle of the 19th century. And he, you see, he called it Cartoon Number One, Substance and Shadow. And it says Substance and Shadow along the bottom and Cartoon Number One down the right hand side. And you see, there's a very mixed group of people in there. And a lot of them are very impoverished, they're very scruffily dressed, there's children and adults, and they're inside the Royal Academy where there's a huge exhibition of very, very expensive pictures. And what this is, is a critical comment by Punch saying, at a time when there's so much poverty around, the sort of poverty that was exposed by Charles Dickens, at that time, how is it that government can be pouring money into expensive uh, exhibitions of cartoons like the Raphael one I've just shown you. And it's called Substance and Shadow because it's a comment on Plato's cave. So you can see all these little underfed children, they're gazing in bewilderment at the shadowy versions of reality that are hanging on the wall. And so since then, this label of cartoon has sort of expanded to cover more or less any comic illustration ranging from just from gentle mockery, mockery to the most vicious of political depictions. So this is 1843, and five years later, John Leach, the punch cartoonist, produced this image of Isaac Newton. Now, if there's one thing that everybody knows about Isaac Newton, it's that he sat underneath an apple tree. It's, the story wasn't really known until about 1820. So at this stage, this is a very, very new story, uh, Leach has added an extra embellishment. You can see there's an apple that's landing on his head. And that was a suggestion by Isaac, I think it's Isaac Disraeli, the father of the prime minister, so, uh, of the future prime minister. So that's a later embellishment. You can also, caricatures like this tell you things about what about the way that people thought that we might otherwise have forgotten that don't necessarily appear in words. So you can see on the left, there's a small dog. And during the 19th century, Isaac Newton was always accompanied by his dog because there was a favorite story uh, that he had a dog called Diamond. And this was when he was at Cambridge and he'd written his second masterpiece and he'd left it on the table and then he'd gone off to chapel. But unfortunately, he'd left a candle on the table and the dog had leapt up and um, knocked the candle onto the papers, which had gone up in flames. And the story is that Newton was, instead of being very angry with the dog, was just very, very patient and forbearing. So this was an example of Newton's modesty and virtue. <laughs> 
And you can see he's also carrying a pipe. And during the 19th century, a pipe was another common attribute of Newton, although we've forgotten about it now. And so I hope you can see this on the left, there's an, another a drawing by Cruikshank. And that illustrates the very, very well-known story that people were always encouraging Isaac Newton to get married, and he was rather reluctant to do so. So here he was, he's courting a beautiful young lady. And this is the epitome of the absent-minded professor, that he's not really thinking about what he's doing, he's thinking about gravity or optics. And he's taken hold of her hand and he's using one of her fingers for tamping down the tobacco in his pipe. So it's another example of how um, written material can show you cultural impressions that otherwise have been forgotten. So I think, at least I claim, that this is the first scientific cartoon. And I hope I've persuaded you also that looking at these pictures is not only fun, but also a valuable source of historical information that reveals how people perceived the political and religious implications of science, technology, and medicine. So I'm going to stop there. So I will unshare my screen and then take questions if there are any. Thank you, Patricia. Hi, Katie. So yes, please do submit any questions, um, audience. Well, I like uh, this role reversal. I mean, instead of me asking you the questions, I know I don't have to answer. I don't have to. You get Although to I will, if I may, I'd like. I would like to ask. No, you can ask some questions, questions if that's okay. Not like when you're a student. <laughs> no, yeah. fortunately, no. You're not, I'm not in the hot seat today. You are. Um, I think one thing that really struck me was the contrast between you said at the beginning how Darwin um, actually really enjoyed the fact that he was mocked and he sort of saw it as a badge of honor whereas mm -hmm. Joseph Banks clearly didn't and found and you know actually actively tried to sort of counter some of the some of the images um it struck well, it can just I just interrupt something sorry yeah uh, there's another example which I, I didn't show you because I didn't want to show too many um it's I've only ever seen one example of it, and that was in a library in Australia. And I think there's only a couple of examples left it intact in the whole world. And it's a very, very savage caricature made by um, his opponents. There was what's called a mathematical mutiny at the Royal Society. And these mathematical opponents wrote a little play, and it had a very, very savage caricature of Banks at the beginning of that. And the fact that there's so, so very few copies of it left in the world suggests that banks actively bought up um, all the um, all the um, prints and also destroyed the plates because that was quite Gosh. a common thing to do so I mean that's why sort of one of the reasons why uh, why I've interpreted his actions as hmm. being sort of in dialogue with all the other caricatures that came out he did not like it <laughs> and I, I find that really interesting I remember reading when the, when the private um, sorry not private eye um the spitting image revival happened and they they there were a lot of interviews and there were people who were quoted as sort of saying it was a it was a badge of honor you know you hadn't really you hadn't really made it until you became a puppet um and i just wondered if you could sort of yeah commentate a bit more on that sense of actually is it is it a sign of success that you kind of can you use these sorts of images to almost identify who are who are the successful people or is that is that maybe a bit of a misguided thing um, and how much how much of that is down to individual personality and individual circumstance I, th I mean I think it still happens I mean someone like Boris Johnson to take a delightful example uh, Boris Johnson I mean he's caricatured all over the place and I imagine that he and Margaret Thatcher and all those other people in a sense enjoy it because because it means they've got instant recognition. I mean, no one would ever bother caricaturing me because I, I'm not important. So, the, but the fact that there's a, if there were a picture of me in the paper, I would be horrified, uh, but I would also recognize absolutely it's a badge of importance. And um, I, I mean, if you want to be in a very, very public position, uh, like, uh, being a, a prominent politician, then I think that's something that you thrive on. I um, mean, I just, I personally find it rather strange. Um, I, I think a lot of the uh, caricatures of Darwin were actually quite affectionate. Um, I, I think perhaps he didn't quite appreciate some of the savagery 
behind some of them because uh, he, he you could you could interpret them as a sort of friendly man with a beard and i think by the time he got to the end of his life he was just so relieved that he'd managed to publish on the origin of species and there hadn't been he hadn't been sort of excommunicated in a way that he feared. I mean, he waited about 20 or 25 years before he published it because he was so worried about the adverse reaction. And actually there was, uh, there was at first, but after about five or 10 years, it had all died down and uh, the caricatures probably helped. I, I want what you were just saying then about, about the active um, engagement with it. You wonder sometimes if there's almost cultivation of imagery that can be can be mocked or can be caricatured in in some in in that sort of sense of prominence you know the sort of slightly you mentioned Boris Johnson people who say about the sort of hair and the fact that you're sort of almost he's almost embracing the fact that he's got the identifiable features that can then in, in themselves be exaggerated yes and I think that was certainly true in the past I mean the, the era of Gilray is best known for its political caricatures and um and yes yeah, some of them were very exaggerated but uh I, I assume that other people collected the ones that they were victims of as well. I mean, I imagine that Darwin was not alone in collecting them. I, I just personally find it quite strange. He would definitely have a spitting image puppet if he was uh, around today, I think, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, one other question um, that's um, come in is, is around, it was interesting, you, you talked about Jenna and those the images around vaccination, I think, is something that we're all sort of very... Um, exactly. tuned into at the moment so as this might be a rather sort of obvious question but I'm interested to explore a little bit more the parallels in the media today in terms of the sort of culture wars science non-science politics um, the sort of scare scaring versus you know uh, cautionary tactics um, mm. because that really struck me in seeing those in seeing those images and, and how they were utilized and why they were utilized uh, I think, um, as I said, so I think initially the protest against being vaccinated was actually quite a sensible thing to do because I think the health risks were quite high because they weren't very hygienic. As I explained, they hadn't really been tested very properly. Uh, whereas nowadays, that that is not a problem. I mean, there are obviously risks. Uh, with every vaccine, but they've been very, very carefully evaluated and the risks have been shown to be far, um, far lower than the risk of actually getting sick. During the 18th century and much of the 19th century, that really wasn't true. There hadn't been any, there hadn't been any proper statistical validation. So I think the scientific arguments are very different then from what they are now. And I hope people realize from what I said that personally, I'm totally pro vaccination. Um, but I think this matter of the compulsory vaccination is something that we still haven't resolved and which is very much in the front of people's minds now. I mean, I think it is quite interesting, that problem of, well, how, how can you prove that you conscientiously really don't want to have a vaccination? I imagine it must have been the same sort of problem for conscientious objectors during the war. But that that is a difficulty that we really haven't sorted out and it does i mean for a lot of people see it as an infringement of their human rights to be forced to have a vaccination mm -hmm. if they don't want to and i spoke to someone a few weeks ago who hadn't been vaccinated and i expressed my surprise and he said i suppose with some justification well we don't know what's going to happen in 20 years time perhaps the vaccination will have a side effect and i suppose because this vaccination has been developed in such a rush that is, to some extent, a valid argument. Although I personally, weighing up all the probabilities, I think it's far better to have a vaccination. And everything you do is a risk. And when you cross the road, you're weighing up the probability of getting to the other side versus falling under a car. So you take risks the whole time. But I, people didn't think then in that statistical way, partly because statistical techniques were only developed during the 19th century and also the, the data just didn't exist there weren't the huge banks of data there wasn't even I mean, we've had a testing program for several months for um the covid vaccinations but there, there wasn't even that there was no testing program so i think in some ways it's similar and in some ways it's different mm -hmm. And I suppose related to that in terms of how how images were used and how they were consumed, I've had a question that's come in about um, 
what what the what the people at the time and maybe this is a very difficult question um to answer but what was it just humorous images that were on on their walls because they were attractive and, and fun or was there actually a deeper um influence on what people then went away and believed or 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 maybe was it a balance i mean how how much influence did they actually have at the time on the people who were who were consuming the materials well i think it's rather like if you see something on television or in the newspapers now things things are that they haven't i don't know you can't quite quantify the influence but it definitely exists i mean something's only funny if something's only satirical it only works as a satire if it is very near the edge of truth there has to be doubts um if it's something completely ludicrous then it doesn't have any effect at all but it, if it's really really near the bone then it challenges you and make you th makes you think and it's rather like if you read um uh, read a critical editorial or you hear a, a panorama research program are there diff different ways of exploring the problem i think they definitely had a very great extent it's, so that's why i emphasize that they were on public display in the print window print shop windows and if you were wealthier you could see them hanging on your wall and people bought them and showed them off in albums so they were very much part of current conversation so i think rather spitting images is rather a good comparison they had a similar sort of role in society I th I, the other thing that struck me when you the newton cartoon as well especially when you're using you're using cartoons as a as a historical source mm. yet the, and there is obviously a, a grain of truth or indeed some, a lot of truth in a lot of them but then you also mentioned how they contribute to an ongoing myth so an image of the apple falling on the head then becomes true in the minds of the future people so untangling that you know what's history and what's myth yes. and what's story and what satire is is quite a challenge but i think also mythology is very important in science uh, the um so so that story about newton sitting under the apple tree was one that he generated about four or five times very shortly before he died so i imagine it's it's sort of in a way how he wanted to be remembered but for various reasons it didn't become known in england until about 100 years later and until the 19th century and i find it a very interesting myth because the prevailing ideology in the 19th century was that and is now is that science is a co collaborative cooperative venture where you try things out and you proceed slowly and you formulate a hypothesis and you test it and you double check everything but the the falling apple story is the complete reverse of that it suggests that you've got one lone individual who gets a sudden flash of inspiration from god or from his own genius or wherever and suddenly a, a theory is born and so people they like the mythology of Newton under the apple tree or James watching a kettle boil and there's various other famous examples. But they seem at the same time to completely contradict how people are saying that science should be carried out. So and that, and that's why it's one of the reasons why I think these myths are very interesting to explore, to see how they've changed, um, because they reflect how people's attitudes towards science have also changed. Yeah. Um, I have one more uh, really interesting question that's come in from Isabel, um, which is wondering whether you've chosen to study the caricatures until the period of Curie, because after that, the medium maybe wasn't used as much in terms of the, the sort of the physical drawings, the, the handwritten, hand, hand drawn. Is that part of the is that part of the canon? Do you think is that part of the reasoning why that why they've why well, that's I changed? Guess. Fury as a sort of obviously as a sort of convenient endpoint, uh, but I think I think the nature the nature of scientific cartoons uh, um, changed partly because science became so complicated um, that I mean you could have a picture of Isaac Newton. I mean, not Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein sort of wandering about relativity. But you, the caricatures that I've shown you and some of the others go demand quite a lot of scientific knowledge. And when you get into the 20th century, I mean, there's no point having a cartoon about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, because most people don't know what what that is. And I suppose the nearest equivalent would be when there were a lot of 
uh, satires about um, genetically modified food. There was sort of Fra Frankenstein food ad adverts. But most of the sort of scientific, the cartoon imagery now, seems it's sort of jokes of, I don't know, scientists falling over a cliff or burning their finger on the Bunsen burner or something, or else they're educational. And that's, that's a format that didn't exist in the 19th century. A lot of children's textbooks have got cartoons in now to help them um, to help them understand the scientific principles. So I think their function is, is slightly different. Uh, I think in general, during the 19th century and the 18th century, the p person looking at them really needed to have quite a subtle and deep understanding of all the different issues involved. Though some of them are really quite complicated and they've got, uh, not particularly the ones I showed today, uh, but some of them have got huge number of very, very detailed, specific references in. So you have to be completely au fait with what's happening. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you say about the educational aspect, because I and my kids are at primary school and you can see how it works the other way around with actually using something like a cartoon or a, a funny story is actually a very good way of simplifying a complicated story. But it maybe then doesn't allow for the more sophisticated understanding of the of the yeah. of the um, of the references within, I don't know. It's a... Yeah, I mean, the caricatures and the cartoons in the 18th and 19th century definitely weren't for children. I mean, no. it wasn't for <laughs> uh, but they, I mean, they, they were very, very powerful and sophist sophisticated. And, and they, there was a publishing market um, in books for children, but they they tended to to be full of sort of moral stories and show little girls sort of looking at the flowers and boys looking through their telescopes <laughs> stars and think, things like that. So they were meant to provide an example of how you should behave and um, how you should want to learn. Um, they weren't they weren't designed so much to help you to learn. That I mean I think that's a very twentieth century or twenty first century even ph phenomenon. And I just have one more comment coming through. I'm not quite sure, Anthony, what this means. What about Schrodinger's cat? <laughs> oh, Schrodinger's cat. As a good, as a good source material for for cartoons, but, perhaps. I mean, that's something that um, I think everybody's heard, well, most people, a lot of people have heard of Schrodinger's cat. But I think an awful lot of people would be hard pushed to explain why it's funny and what it means and whether it really exists and and everything else so i think i think i think he intent is it i can't remember who um is it schrodinger i think yes oh, yeah yeah um yes schrodinger's cat sorry um i think he suggested it as a joke originally and you definitely you definitely see cartoons and indeed memes you know that that 21st century version of a cartoon perhaps I've seen a lot of Schrodinger's cat memes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course it was Schrodinger's because it's Schrodinger's cat. Um, yes, but I don't think, I mean, if you ask most people why, what happened when the apple fell down from the tree, a lot of people, they don't know why it's important. They don't yeah. know what it means. And I think if you, ask, if you ask people to explain about Schrodinger's cat not being there the minute you open the door of the cage and all that <laughs> stuff, they would not have a clue what that meant and they couldn't relate it to... Um, quantum theory so in that case does the simplicity of the image actually become a barrier to explaining the science um well it was i mean i think it was i, I don't know enough about the history of how it was that he coined it he didn't initially set it up as a picture he set it up mm. as a no I, I just but i mean in general i think some you know I, that more generally well, I think is it's rather like um dna the double D helix of dna um, most people, well, they can manage the double helix, but they can't get to the CGAT, or even if they can, they're not really sure exactly what it means, but it, mm. you just, you, you've got instant recognition. You immediately know what a double helix is and why it's in, important without understanding what it's about. I, mean, I suppose in a way that uh, medal that I showed, um, Am I Not a Man and a Brother by Wedgwood with that symbol of the slave with his hands chained up, up like that. That is often said to be the first political slogan and the first political symbol that there ever was. And Wedgwood was extremely, extremely good at marketing his, his own pottery. I mean, that is, so he invented advertising really in the 18th century. So, I mean, I think that power of the image was something that he recognized and was very adept at. And I, that relates to the cartoons as well.
Well, I've, we're running out of time, so I'm going to stop there, Patricia. Thank you so much for a, a really, again, very wide ranging and, and thorough guide okay. through the centuries. Thank nice. <laughs> um, and thank you also to our to our audience for some really interesting questions and for um, engaging in, in in such an interesting talk. Um, it's 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 really enjoyable to see so many images. Actually, I think as as you, um, it, it is a really helpful way of understanding some again quite complex themes so thank you very much for putting that together for us today okay um, thank you bye, -bye. enjoy your weekend everybody <laughs> bye -bye. absolutely thank you